Hello everyone, I'm history professor Jared Frederick and welcome to our inaugural episode of Real History where I'll be sitting down and reacting to some historical films. And our first episode for tonight will be featuring Sam Mendez's recent film 1917 which is loosely based off of the exploits of his own grandfather who served in the British Army during the First World War. As we go through this, I'll be offering a little bit of Keller commentary beyond my reactions, talking about some of the historical merits, perhaps some of the scholarly flaws that can be found in this movie, and hopefully we'll be learning some things along the way in addition to being entertained. So without further ado, Let's start 1917. The date here at the beginning is telling because it was only a few days earlier that the United States had entered World War I. And so the British had been hard at it several years by this point, awaiting American assistance, shall we say. This opening shot here I think is equally telling because the first visual that we get is Europe as it once was before it is ravaged by like, the war. Like, but I get a sense that the scenery so will be changing here very quickly. You can get a sense that the material culture in this movie is quite good from the beginning. They really did some fine research on the uniforms, the appearance of the soldiers. And one problem that we often see in a lot of war movies is that soldiers are just often too old. You know, guys in their 30s and their 40s, sometimes older. And at least initially here, it looks like everyone is about the right age. So good for them for good casting on that front. Looks like we're slowly descending into the mirth here. All of the muck of military camp. It's these everyday behind the scenes vignettes that we often don't see in war movies. Men getting their hair cut. Having your hair cut on the front lines was very important. The shorter your hair was, the less infestation of lice that you would have. A good period detail that we can see here hovering above the trenches and running along the, the walls of it is field wire. And both during World War I and World War II, there would just be endless miles of this stuff strung up from every tree and lamp post and fence post imaginable. A true indicator of this being one of the first modern wars. The strategic withdrawal that General Erringmore is talking about here is the creation of the Hindenburg Line that took place in early 1917. The Germans had suffered greatly at the battles of Verdun, the Battle of Somme, the, the previous year, and by yielding ground and withdrawing to a more condensed line of defense, uh, it was hopeful that they would gain the upper edge. And so that's undoubtedly what he's talking about here. I'm not sure why they wouldn't be able to warn them even if the telephone lines were cut. Carrier pigeons were a form of communication. They could drop a message baton from an airplane. But then I guess that would render the whole plot of the movie unnecessary then, wouldn't it? Sending two men to give word to 1600 may seem a little bit ludicrous. But in the vast totality of these campaigns on the Western Front, 1,600 men is not a lot of men. There were hundreds of thousands of men involved in these various engagements. And so, I suppose proportionately speaking, two men for 1,600 isn't as ludicrous as it may sound. This is where we really begin to get a sense of 
the choreography and the coordination that went into all of this. Um, of course, the, the film was shot to present the illusion of it being one continuous shot and you get a real sense of the mastery and the cinematography and these meandering scenes going through the trench lines. And it certainly helps create that, that tenseness, that immediacy, uh, as well as the claustrophobia of life in the trenches. These are some of the other details that I'm enjoying in watching these trench scenes. In the foreground, of course, you see the two main characters in their mad dash to embark upon their mission. But in the background, you see all these other elements, too. Men going through mail, smoking, trying to heat their food, move from one spot to another in the line. A lot of really good details playing out here in the background that were uh, behooved to take a look at. Thanks to the, the, the appearance of the one continuous shot, you also get a sense of how labyrinth-like these trenches were and they could stretch on for miles and miles and miles at a time and were really immersed in here as an audience. Tensions could often run very high here in the front lines. Troops were very rarely left for more than 30 days in these sorts of positions because it was thought that people couldn't survive more than that, psychologically speaking. And as one lieutenant said of these sorts of environments, there was a limit to human endurance. You could only take life in the trenches and undergoing these barrages and shelling so much before you cracked. And we got a quick sense of that with this brief confrontation that that soldier had with Blake's care. These battles would go on for so long, weeks, months, even years at a time, that oftentimes it was just layer after layer of dead, different generations of corpses from different campaigns and different movements. And certainly when American soldiers finally arrived on the scene in late 1917, 1918, they found these grim reminders from seasons past. That's that Leslie, sir. What is that? We have a message from General Aramore. You are relieved. No, sir. Where the fucking hell are they due? We don't know, sir, but we've got soldiers across here. That is the German front line. We know, sir. In the words and demeanor of the character of Lieutenant Leslie here, we once more get a sense of how emotionally draining and psychologically stressful this sort of lifestyle on the front lines was. And a sense of fatalism was applied to it. Also many of you have probably heard of the phrase trench humor, often a form of dark comedy. And that's what we see here as well, I think. Many of you have also heard of the phrase over the top. This was also a phrase used to describe going over the trench wall and of course when something is over the top today it is overkill, it's crazy, it's insanity and indeed that's what going over the top was for these soldiers. Once again that, that immersive boots on the ground perspective that we're getting here. By the way, historians estimate that somewhere around 8 million Horses, mules, and donkeys were killed in the First World War. Even though it was one of the first modern wars, these animals were still highly used, often to pull artillery, pull wagons, pull supplies. The age of old cavalry charges were long gone, though. No Man's Land was a truly horrific and bewildering and nightmarish place, as we can see here just endless coils of barbed wire, corpses draped in them. Sometimes 
entangled in this mess for months, maybe even years at a time. He'll be lucky if that's the only wound he gets. The aura that is captured here is spot on. This fog shrouded, abandoned wasteland. Oh. Death was absolutely inescapable here. And Schofield just found that out the hard way. It's a wonder these actors didn't get trench foot. They probably had to spend countless hours in this muck. And of course, trench foot was very common among World War I soldiers. Once again, if the British had air support in this sector, why aren't the airplanes trying to send the message as well? You could try to send messages through multiple means, through all the means that I just mentioned, but trying it through only one singular method as soldiers on foot as we see here seems like perhaps not the best strategy in getting that message through. We see a tank here in the background and of course it was hoped that these tanks could roll right over these trench lines and they often could but in other cases as well they could get stuck in the mud as we just saw with the the piece of armor here in the mire some master cinematography here once again as we go down into the depths with our two protagonists and it also shows to the audience the scale of some of these impact craters that could be caused by these explosions you know you can fit multiple school buses in some of these and and these scars can still be found in eastern France and in Belgium and the various battlefields to this very day it'll be hundreds maybe thousands of years until these scars of the Great War vanish from this terrain and on an artistic note you just have to love the soundtrack of Thomas Newman here really building up the suspense here as we're on the verge of the German lines. And they're gone. And as we can see here, the Germans weren't living in any conditions that were more luxurious than what our British friends were. Whether they were not long gone is debatable. Many of the Germans left their lines by the third week of March, which would be about two weeks before this movie is set. But there were some elements of the German lines that stuck around till early April, depending upon what sector of the lines were in here. But the audience is never really informed with that sort of uh, specificity. So perhaps it is one of those final elements to leave that we're encountering here. Sometimes these underground complexes could be quite elaborate. They were like small cities in these subterranean compounds almost. And perhaps what we're seeing here is an underground barracks, perhaps an evacuated hospital. And oftentimes when there are construction projects in Belgium and France to this very day, construction crews will uncover these sorts of facilities while they're digging up streets or putting down new pavement. They're everywhere. And we probably don't even have a full comprehension of just how elaborate some of them were. And many of them will go undiscovered, I imagine. The inundation of rats and vermin is a very authentic feature of this movie thus far. These rodents were everywhere and sometimes they were the size of cats because they had an unending supply of carrion and rotting flesh to feast on. And men would actually have contests and they would collect them and they would string them up like they were war trophies. Truly horrific stuff. Oh no. Oh no. 
these sorts of booby traps were not uncommon especially as troops are displacing and moving from an old line to a new one to leave a little nasty prize behind for the enemy not uncommon at all The blinding of men was also a common occurrence on the Western Front, not due to dust like we see here necessarily, but chemical gases, mustard gas, chlorine gas, uh, that could blind hundreds of men at a time. And often, uh, replacements who were being brought up to the front lines were often greeted by this 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 grim view of long formations of blind men with their hands on the shoulder of the man in front of them being led to the rear. What a welcome sign in, indeed that was. I thought it was going to be something easy. All right? I never thought it would be this. As the old saying goes, never volunteer for anything. So do you want to go back? Just fire the fucking flare. There's a nice little subtlety in this scene, you know, where we we get a sense of Schofield's frustration and but he's not gonna leave his comrade. We, we see that sense of brotherhood that is really universal for a lot of these different time periods. And it looks like a, a lot of spent brass shells here around perhaps some 10 centimeter German guns. And I happen to have a German artillery round here that was later turned into trench art by an American soldier at Chateau Thierry. And it it, it really speaks to, I think, the humanity of these soldiers in World War I, that they were able to take this garbage, essentially, from this ugliness of war, and they were able to turn it into these unique pieces of artwork that are highly collectible today. Uh, this one was manufactured in Germany in the year 1916. These kind of sensory luxuries of World War I soldiers are always interesting. The smell of perfume on a letter, uh, biscuits from home, or hair oil sent by a girlfriend. You know, just, just a quick whiff of them could bring back a, a sense of home, and you really couldn't put a dollar amount on something like that. Heading back home. I wonder what they saw. What was the bridge line say? Well, that's your men sorted then. What do you mean? Mine's called from Blake, showing unusual valor rescuing a comrade from certain death. If I got a medal, I'd take it back home. Why didn't you just take it home? Look, it's just a bit of bloody tin. It doesn't make you special. It doesn't make any difference to anyone. I hate it, don't I? I hate it. When I knew I couldn't stay. When I knew I had to leave. And they might never see me. In conversations like this, we get a quick reminder that it's not just the war being fought on the front lines, it's the war being fought on the home front as well, that each one of these men has loved ones who he's left behind and every time they go home could be their last. Again. Looks like it. Dog fight. 
One can only imagine what these dog fights were like, which sometimes involved dozens of planes swirling around hundreds of feet above the air in very primitive biplanes. As we are about to see here, these planes could often be death traps. Single engine planes made of wooden canvas. And crashing in them could often be a death sentence. Pilots were often known for a sense of chivalry. Perhaps this German pilot did not have any. And, you know, we, we could ask ourselves in scenes like these, uh, is, is this an old cinematic trope about the godless German heathen? Would a pilot have really acted that way, even under uh, the sense of strain and confusion that he was in? Or is this a cinematic device to kind of paint this evil, faceless sort of German figure lurking in the shadows? Among the other artifacts that I have here is a German belt buckle with the words inscribed on it, Gott mit uns, which means God is on our side. And this was brought home by a soldier in my local area. And uh, it has part of the original belt still attached to it. And it was made in Mannheim, Germany in 1918. Come on. Your brother. We have to find your brother. You'll recognize him. He looks like me. He's a baton. Correspondence in moments like these was so profoundly important for soldiers. Despite this being the first modern war, there were still some notions of chivalry, there were Victorian sensibilities, a desire to have a good death and even more importantly to let one's loved ones know that they had had a good death, that they had died valiantly in the face of the enemy, that their final thoughts were of family. These were incredibly important sentiments, uh, even amidst this global war in the manner that it was fought. It's a very sincere and authentic moment that we see playing out here. Along the same lines as letters, sending a few token items to be sent home were accordingly very important as well. The helmet that Schofield just had passed back to him uh, is very similar in its design to one in my collection. Uh, the American and British helmets were of a very similar design during World War I, and they're almost medieval looking in appearance. Uh, they had this rim around them to protect soldiers' heads from shrapnel and debris that would fall down on them from above. 
And so, what's so unique about this one is that mine. there's a little bit of putty placed here on the top where a soldier patched uh, some damage that was done to his helmet. And so it adds a, a real human element to an otherwise uh, lifeless, tangible artifact much like this. Incredible stuff.